Hello everyone, and today we are doing a deck tech for Zask Skittering Swarmlord. Zask says you can play lands and cast insect spells from your graveyard. He's a 5-5 five, five for 5, and when another insect you control dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library, then mill two cards. And then we can pay one and a black or green hybrid. Uh, target insect gets plus one plus zero and gains death touch until end of turn. So he's nice, we can play lands from our grave, cast insects from our grave. Um, he helps fill our grave and make sure our guys never truly die, and then we can get in some good blocks because who wants to block like a 2-1 death toucher, right? Alright, this is just Zask, Insect Tribal. Game plan. Zask needs to be into play for the deck to work properly. Uh, he's just such a key element, he does so much stuff, the whole deck is made with him being on the field. The goal of the deck is just to keep outvaluing our opponents and play our cards from the grave that never truly go away and swing in with as much as we can, because we're going to win by ba uh, combat damage. Zach, Zach, Zach can give death touch at instant speed so our opponents don't want to block it because you know it's a two on death touch who wants to block. Zach fills our, I'm calling him Zach for now on. Zach fills our graveyard naturally um, by our bugs dying so we don't really need to put a ton of self mill into this deck. Uh, Zach also lets us play lands from the grave so there are some strip locking effects which we'll talk about when we get there. And then we have a good amount of shuffle abilities uh, that are needed because since Zach puts them on the bottom um we gotta shuffle them around so they're not like really on the bottom planeswalkers we got grist grist is an insect uh, pretty much all the time uh except when she's on the field so grist big thing about this when grist dies it triggers zach while grist is in the graveyard and since grist grist isn't on the field uh she's considered just a one one so it does trigger zach uh, she also makes 1-1 one, one, and then self mills, which is pretty nice, puts a loyalty on her. We can sacrifice a creature and then destroy another creature or planeswalker, which is nice, the old one for one. And then we can minus her. Uh, each opponent loses life equal to the number of creature cards in our graveyard. I think we only run like 27 creatures, believe it or not. We just get them back so frequently, it's not that big of a deal. Um, that's not really the big reason. She's just good for making guys, blocking, um, and just destroying things. She's just good overall. Let's go to creatures. Ant Queen, 5-5 five, five for 5. Pay 2 mana, make it, make an insect. Uh, that's pretty much it. Again, we're kind of a token deck in a way. Um, and we're going to primarily win with just combat damage. So Ant Queen helping flood our board like, on the end step is really, really nice. Bane of the Living, 4 mana, 4-3 four, with Morph. When Bane of the Living is turned face up, all creatures get minus X, minus X, where, you know, X is the Morph cost you're paying to it. So... Bane of the Living is kind of nice, just because it's a 4 mana 4-3, sure, fine, but if it's in our hand, we can morph it down, and it kind of acts as a nuke, which is kind of nice for whatever we can give into it. Blex, I didn't put his backside on it, because the deck isn't really going to be using Blex as his backside, so he's a 3 mana 3-2, three and he says, your other creatures get plus 1, plus 1, and then whenever uh, he dies, you just gain 4 life. He's pretty much just a lord, we're not going to worry about his backside, because we're just not really going to use it. Blight Beetle, pro green, and creatures your opponent's control can have 1-1 one, one counters on him. He's kind of just like a hate piece. Doesn't really do anything for our deck, but he's nice just to be able to be mean to our opponents. Kenotep, Keno, Kenopatek, I'm scared for him, whatever, I can't, I can't read stuff. 4 mana flying 1-1, one, one. when he enters the battlefield, exile target player's grave, not ours, just someone else's. For each artifact or land exile this way, make a 1-1 one, one insect artifact with flying it's nice just because he's kind of good grave hate not for us but just like if someone else like is caring about their deck mill reanimator whatever he's a good way to flood out our board with a lot of guys tomb sentinel is a really good value because it says when it enters the battlefield from a graveyard which is usually ours exile up to one target non-land permanent which is nice because we can play insects from our graveyard and it just so happens it is an insect it has on earth if we you know we don't have our commander on the field but still just casting from the graveyard after it like whatever we mill it or somehow it gets there and just getting rid of stuff it's really nice Caustic Caterpillar, it's 1-1 one, one for 1, great rate, and then we can just sacrifice it to destroy target artifact or enchantment. It's really nice, it's just good removal, we can do a lot. Circuit Mender, when it enters, we gain 2, when it leaves, draw a card. I kind of like this because it's a good blocker, um, and it's just a good reanimation target if we just like need to gain 2 life or just block with it, because when it dies, it leaves the battlefield if we just still draw a card, so it's kind of good either way. Crash of Rhino Beetles, it's just a big creature, I think it's kind of funny. Um, 
five mana trample five five is a fine rate and then if we have uh 10 or more lands which is a lot it's a 15 15 with trample not the best but i just kind of think it's funny so i decided to leave it in um i'm gonna say this now there are not many great insects um so this is kind of what we're working with i did the best i could giant out of age seven minute seven seven trample when it deals combat damage to a player just make a token of it so you know you just kind of flood out with these giant seven sevens that you know first you have one then you have two then you have four eight and then you, you know the game's over by that point so no one deals with them giant ant ankeg how do you guys pronounce it it's an eight mana eight eight with trample and ward two pretty good other creatures you control have trample and ward two we're a battle cruiser deck we got to swing in with as much as we can and just making our creatures annoying to target or and you know just giving them trample is great and the good thing with that is is since zach gives death touch um we only have to deal one damage and then the rest transples over hey wire might one mana one one when it dies gain two life cool doesn't matter but again it's basically just cost a caterpillar it's exile target non-creature artifact or non-creature enchantment um typically typically that doesn't matter too much uh because we can just get rid of like big stinky enchantments the nice part is that it does exile it um and again since it's an insect we can just cast it over and over again hornet nest Defender 0-2, we're just going to let people swing into this, and when it's dealt damage, we make that many 1-1 one, one insect flyers with death touch. Pretty good, you know. Next up, we have Hornet Queen, right? 7 mana 2-2, two, two, flying death touch. When it enters, create 4 one ones with flying and death touch. She's just annoying. Uh, it's a lot of death touch, so, you know, you get 5 guys for 7 mana with evasion and death touch. It's good. Azoni, 1,000 eyed weird mana cost one of the only non insects in the deck when she enters the battlefield make an insect for each creature card in her graveyard spoiler alert it's a lot right and then we can pay two mana to sacrifice another creature and we gain a life and draw a card it's just good card draw when we need it and also it the thing with hornet queen and sorry yeah hornet queen and azoni is the point of them is she they both flood out our boards with insects that's the whole reason they're there Cruel Harpooner. This is the kind of the part where we don't really have many insects, right? So I like Cruel Harpooner just because it's a 2 mana 3 2 with reach, which is a great rate. And then when he enters the battlefield, choose a creature with flying and then choose up to a creature with flying. Um, and then they fight. Spoiler alert, Cruel, Har Cruel Harpooner typically doesn't go away just by himself, right? He typically takes a flyer down with him. And since we can cast him from the graveyard, it doesn't really matter anyway. He's just kind of weird. He's like weird removal in a way. Um, and even we don't even have to do it. Living Hive, important. It says it's an elemental. It's actually an insect elemental. It got around in an oracle text, but this, believe me, is an insect elemental. It's an eight mana six, six trample when it deals combat damage to a player. Uh, we make that many 1-1 one, one green insects. It's good because with um, Zack, we can give a death touch. So really only one of that damage is like going to have to matter per creature. But the thing that's nice about death touch and trample is that damage is always getting through. Mazurik, Cruel Death Priest. Cruel? Crowl? I don't know how to pronounce it, but I, I'm going to pronounce it Cruel for now on. Because that's what it looks like. Cruel Death Priest. Flying, whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control. So that's any player sacrificing a permanent. We buff up our entire team. And he's also an insect, so it's kind of cool. Nintoko Cultivator is a weird card for the deck, but I kind of like it in theory, right? So when he enters the battlefield, you may discard any number of lands and then put that many 1-1 one, one counters on him and then draw that many cards. So I guess if he's in our grave and we're just like drawing, even if we just draw one land, we can cast him from our graveyard and he's still uh what he's basically even if we get rid of one land right he's a four mana three three that draws us a card right and since we can play lands from our graveyard anyways he kind of helps fill it. It, it he's nice he's nice phyrexian swarm lord um it should have the phyrexian type on it so i believe it's still a phyrexian insect horror six mana four four with infect we don't have a lot of Infect in this deck, but we do have a little bit of Infect, and he's one of them. At the beginning of our upkeep, make a 1-1 one, one Insect with um, an insect with Infect for each Poison counter your opponents have. So, again, we don't have a lot of Infect, but since he kind of does Infect by himself, and we give him Death Touch so he's like annoying to block, we could just be getting a good amount of like extra Insect guys to go along with it. Realm Walker, that's an Insect. Um, we say insect, we can basically just look at the top part of our deck and we play insects off the top of our deck. 
it's just nice. I know we operate from the grave a lot, but it is always nice to be able to know what we're going to be drawing and stuff, and just being able to play the top card of our deck essentially gives us an extra card in our hand at all times. Saber Ants, weird card from Mercadian Masks. When it's dealt damage, we put that many 1-1 green insects into play. So the re he's basically like Hornet Naps, but better and worse, right? So the thing I like about him is he's a 2-3, so he doesn't like die right away um, when he's dealt like damage. Like he can like block tokens and like still live, but Hornet Nest doesn't really do too much. That does make death touchers. Um, but the thing about this is we can always like attack with him, and if someone wants to block it, then we can just make a ton of guys. I don't know. There are not many great insects. Scrooge Swarm, probably one of our better insects in this deck. Whenever a lance enters the battlefield, make an insect. If we have six or more of these guys, we make another Scoot Swarm. So they really funnel out, like, a lot. They, they funnel out. They, they, you know, if anyone's played standard with him or have ever played against a landfall deck, you see and know how obscene Scoot Swarm is. Springleaf Avenger, he's got ninjutsu for some reason, um, but he's an insect, and I like him. When he deals damage to a player, or combat damage to a player, return target permanent card from our graveyard to our hand, right? The thing I like about him, right, is with Zack on the field, we're going to leave up our mana before damage anyways, because someone's like, oh, if I block, I, like, they don't want to block our guys just because they're like, well, Zack's just going to give him death touch and I don't want to lose my guy, right? So we can swing him with, like, a 1-1 one -one insect. Oh, surprise, it's actually Springleaf Avenger. Um, and he's going to get permanent cards from our grave to our hand. He's just kind of good reanimation. Plus, like, 5 mana, 6-5 is pretty good. Sir Conrad the Grim... He's the only like other non-insect creature in the deck, but he is good because he says whenever another creature dies or a creature card is put into a graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield or a creature card leaves your graveyard, he deals one damage to each opponent. So it's nice, right? Because it's whenever another creature dies, right? Everyone, every opponent takes one, right? Whenever a creature card is milled from us, right? Everyone takes one. Or whenever we reanimate one of our guys and just cast them from our grave, everyone takes one. And then we can just mill and then everyone like typically will take one. So he's he's as good. He does a lot, a lot of like kind of unintentional damage to everyone except us, which is nice. Vorpede, I just think it's a big stinky insect and I like it. Five mana four, five four with vigilance and trample and undying. So then we swing in with it. If it dies, oh, whatever, oh well. And now it's a six five with vigilance and trample. And then if it dies again, it's just back in our deck or it's you know in our graveyard and we can just reanimate it later which is still nice let's go to sorceries balagate recovery since we are milling a lot right we do have to be able to get card stuff there is a land on the back which is still nice um but we're running this just because we can get a card from our graveyard back to our hand um beacon of unrest put target artifact or creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under our control so we can hit our opponent's big creatures from their graveyard or artifacts from their graveyard or really our own but I know it kind of sounds silly, but Beacon of Unrest is important because we shuffle it into our library, which makes us shuffle our deck, right? As I said earlier, it's really important for us to be shuffling our deck pseudo-frequently so our insects that do die, that get sent to the bottom of the deck, don't really stay on the bottom of the deck. Cultivate, still kind of shuffle the same, like, shuffle with, like, the same logic of, like, you know, we don't want to keep our insects on the bottom. It's going to get us two lands, right? It's just good ramp, whatever. Diabolic Intent, I chose this over Tutor just because I wanted to keep this deck kind of cheap, um, and I kind of like it just because we sacrifice a creature, which is nice because it can mill us and do all that good stuff, and then we just search our deck for a card and put it in our hand, which is good, you know, situational Tutor. Kodama's Reach, it's just ramp and it shuffles our deck, it's good. Tutor also shuffles our deck, which is good. Patriarch Spitting. Each player chooses a creature type. We're just saying insect, right? Each player returns all creature cards of the chosen type from the graveyard to the battlefield. This card is troublesome for me. So it's in the deck because I like the idea of if we mill a lot of cards like late game, we can get all of our insects back, right? Which is really, really cool, right? But if an opponent's playing tribal, like it still does help our opponent because they can just get like the best creature from the grave on the battlefield. But I feel like since we're playing tribal, it works good for us. Trying for the Hordes, uh, one of our main win cons for the deck, until end of turn, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and trample, and infect, which is just great, because Triumph for the Hordes, you see it in play, like, you know, in other decks, it typically means someone's dying, um, and that's what it does. Victimize, choose two card, <laughs> choose two target creature cards in your graveyard, sacrifice a creature, if you do, return the chosen cards to the battlefield attack. 
it's nice just because we're able to just kind of get rid of like one of our creatures, have it go to the bottom of our deck, um, and then we reanimate two big guys uh, that have been milled into our grave. It's just good reanimation. Let's go to instance. Abrupt Decay, it's just good removal, can't be countered, and we just destroy something uh, with mana cost three or less. Uh, instance B2 mana, it's fine. Assassin's Trophy, just get rid of something we don't like. They can have a land, uh, not the best uh, that they get a land, but still, it's fine. It just gets rid of a permanent, which is great. Beast Within, same thing, get rid of permanent, they get a 3-3. That 3-3 is better than whatever we got rid of. Deadly Dispute, we do make a good amount of tokens, and since they're just 1-1s, one I like the idea of just being able to sacrifice those guys instantly to draw two cards and make a treasure. Um, it's just good card draw. It's good ramp in a way, um, and who cares if like, our creatures die because they either, uh, they're either a token and it's no big deal, or it just gets shuffled back into our deck anyways. Uh, Grizzly Salvage, over the top five cards of our deck, put a creature card or land from among them into our hand, put the rest into our graveyard. It's good. It, it's just like, we fill our grave, it's good. We put the best card in our hand, it's good. And it's two mana instant speed, it's fantastic. Harrow, sacrifice a land as an additional cost, search your deck for up to two basic lands, put it in a battlefield. Um, it's just another one, it's a shuffle thing, just good. And two, we want our lands in the graveyard anyway, so we can just play them. So like, it's nice because we can pay three mana, right? Or like tap our land, right? For mana, and then sacrifice it, play Harrow, on like turn three, right? And then we get two more lands and then we just boom another land in the play for our landfall with Crystal on the field. Maybe not turn three, but you know what I mean. Heroic Intervention, we're kind of a tutor, or not a tutor, a token deck in a way. Um, and we don't want our board dying, so we have to completely reset. Like we're fine with our creatures dying, but not our entire board. So just being able to give our whole team Hexproof and Pro Nukes is pretty good. Nameless Inversion is very important, right? So. It says Tribal Instant Shapeshifter. It's a changeling, right? This card is every creature type at all times. Target creature gets plus three and minus three and loses all creature types until end of turn. It just so happens that Zach says that we can cast in or insect cards from our graveyard, not insect creatures, insect cards. Because this thing has changeling, we can pay three mana and just give a creature plus three minus three. Because again, this is an insect. Putrefy, it's just good removal. We get rid of an artifact or a creature we don't like, and it can't be regenerated. Regenerate's not super relevant in Commander, um, but still, we just get rid of an artifact or creature. Uh, Roiling Regrowth, it's basically Harrow. Sacrifice the lands, reject for two basic lands, put it in the battlefield. Tapped, and then you shuffle, so it's good. Same thing, play the land later. And then Village Rights, um, it's just good draw. Uh, it's good mill if we need to, um, and all that. And again, we don't really care if our creatures die too much. It's just good card draw to have. Let's go to artifacts altar of dementia arguably a win con in a way uh i put this in mind with sacrificing our insects or whatever to self mill ourselves but if we could if like an opponent's not really playing like a graveyard batters deck we could totally just get rid of our board and start milling them out and see if we can kill them that way arcane signet it's just a rock and ashnod's altar we can sacrifice our insects to mill more and cast them so we get man like we sacrifice an insect we mill two cards we, then we can play our insects from our graveyard with the two mana we just got. It's it's like weird ramp in a way. Um, it kind of like funnels our deck because like, oh, we can pay, we get two mana like every time. It's it's just good. It helps us like stay consistent. Desecrated Tomb. Whenever one or more creature cards leave our graveyard, uh, make a 1-1 one -one bat with flying. We don't really care about the bats. They're just kind of good tokens and they fly, um, you know, which is nice. But it's kind of good because, again, we're just kind of reanimating all our guys with Zack anyways. Elixir of Immortality. I don't really ever put this in my decks, right? But typically because I don't find it so good. But for this deck, I decided to make the exception. It's one mana artifact that says, pay two, tap it. You gain five life, which isn't super relevant. But then we shuffle it and our graveyard into our library, which is really, really nice because, like, if our you know, we mill too much or like we need to get something back or whatever happens, right? Someone tries to exile our grave. We at least have a way out of it and it just makes it so like we can't mill ourselves out. Like it won't let us mill ourselves out. Herald's Horn, we say insect, insects cost one less at the beginning of our upkeep. Look at the top card, if it's an inf insect, reveal it, put it in our hand. If not, no big deal. But it still does make our insects cost one less. So it's kind of like ramp in a way. Icon of Ancestry. Insects get plus one, plus one, pay three mana, look at the top three cards, we can reveal an insect, and then put it in our hand, the rest on the bottom in a random order. Which is nice, you know, like, 
I really, the reason I like Icon of Ancestry, mainly for tribal decks, right? Well, only for tribal decks, is because I like the idea of just being like, I have nothing else to do on my opponent's end step with like mana I have open. Cause it's true that we're not always gonna have our mana open or if we're holding up like an instant or removal or a combat or whatever, right? Like if we don't wanna do it, we can just be like, oh, whatever, look at the top three, gamble, let's see if we get an insect or not. We really have like a one in three chance. Greaves, we put them on Zach. We need Zach to live. So Greaves makes Zach lives. Perpetual timepiece. I, I I don't know. I was kind of iffy about putting it in. I like it because we just mill two, which is nice. So just two mana artifact, tap it, mill two, or we can pay two, exile it, and then we shuffle any number of target cards from our graveyard back into our library. This is kind of like Elixir of Immortality in a way, but at least more selective, which I think is pretty good. Again, it just makes it so we can't mill out um, and it helps like protect our grave. It's about to be bogged or whatever. Skull Clamp. A lot of our guys are 1-1, one, one, so we can just pay one mana to draw two cards and kill a creature. It's pretty good. Soul Ring, because it's Soul Ring. Strixhaven Stadium. Um, tap it, get a mana, and then we put a counter on it. And then whenever a creature does combat damage to... Whenever we deal combat damage to an opponent, uh, we put a counter on it. And then if it has 10 or more counters, they just straight up lose the game. I like it because we kind of are a token deck. Uh, our opponents don't want to block our guys because we can just give them death touch for whatever they choose to block. Uh, which is kind of nice. So it's just a, like a silly way to make someone like lose the game. Usually in my decks, I make, I like to have like a silly win con, like, oh, it kills an opponent or like we win the game. And Strixhaven Stadium is like one of the new all-stars for me. Swiftfoot Boots, same thing as Lightning Greaves. We just straight up put them on Zach. We don't want them to die from like targeted removal because we need them on the field. Vanquisher's Banner, Insects get plus one, plus one. And then whenever we cast an Insect, we just draw a card. Let's go to Enchantments. Cemetery Tampering. Kind of weird, but has Hideaway 5. Hideaway just means look at the top 5 cards of our deck, choose one of them, and exile it, right? The beginning of our upkeep, we may mill 3 cards. Cool. And then if there are 20 more cards in our graveyard, we can pay the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So it's kind of nice to be able to sneak up um, on our opponents, because we will one, we want to mill anyway, which is nice, right? Cemetery Tampering does that, and 3 mana is a good rate. And then when there are 20 or more cards, which happens a lot faster than you'd think, especially since Zach mills 2 whenever an insect dies. Uh, we can play whatever we have hidden away for free pretty easily. Crawling Infestation. A newer card from, I guess, Val. Um, I've never seen it before making this deck, so I figured it might as well. At the big end of Rupkeep, you may mill two cards, so we don't have to. And then whenever one or more creatures are put into the graveyard from anywhere during your turn, we just make an insect. So one, I just kind of like it because it mills a couple if we want it to. And then whenever like one of our guys dies or goes away, uh, we make a 1-1, one, one. and since it happens only once each turn, if an opponent on their turn kills a creature, like one of our insects, and we block, we still get, like, another guy to, like, replace it. Um, and then we have Dictator Erebus, so whenever one of our creatures dies, each opponent loses a creature, and I can guarantee you we're going to have more access, more easy access to our creatures than they will theirs. Exploration, you may play an additional land on our turn. Which is nice because since Zach can play from the graveyard, uh, we can play two lands from the graveyard every turn. And since we're milling a lot, we're probably always going to have it. And then we have Guardian Project. Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature, which it won't because it's Commander, uh, we just draw a card. So really, whenever a creature enters the battlefield, draw a card. That's all it says in Commander. Let's go to land. Bajukabog enters the battlefield, exiles someone's grave if they, we don't like what they're doing. Um, and it just taps for a black. It's fine. I put it over a swamp, really. Uh, that's really it. It just makes sure that our opponents don't have a grave. Castle Lockwain. It's just good card draw if we need it. Sure, we lose some life, but, like, again, it's just, like, essentially four mana draw a card and lose some life. Command Beacon. Since we need Zack in play, I have Command Beacon in this deck. It taps for a colorless, or we can tap it and sacrifice it and then put Zack from our command zone into our hand. Um, and then we can play Zach, and then since we can play lands from our graveyard, we can just play Command Beacon, so Zach doesn't really have commander attacks when we have Command Beacon. Command Tower, because it taps for one or the other. Uh, Death Cat Clade, same thing. Um, and then we have Evolving Wilds, which is nice because it searches for a basic, but more importantly, it shuffles our deck, and we kind of need those kinds of things. Plus, it's nice because when we have Zach in play, we can just Evolving Wilds every turn, so we're never missing a land drop. Fable Passage, same thing as Evolving Wilds, but it's better because it comes in untapped. We also have Field of the Dead. Just because we have such ready access to our lands, Field of the Dead is good, and, you know, we have more than seven non-basic lands, so it's nice. It's just good to have more 
you know, creature presence, and, you know, it's fine, since we can reanimate lands pretty much whenever with Zach. Ghost Quarter is one I talked about strip locking earlier. For those of you who aren't familiar, strip locking is basically when you uh, have effects like Zach that say you can play lands from your graveyard, right? And then you have cards like Ghost Quarter, but mainly Strip Mine, but we'll see that card in a second. Sacrifice Ghost Quarter, destroy target land. Its controller may search the library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield. Um, it's nice because we can hit duels or utility lands, which is good. Um, and then since we can just play it from our grave anyway, we can just start doing it over and over again. And eventually they'll just run out of non-basic lands. Or basic lands. Land of our waste, it's fine. Untap duel, we can take a damage, no big deal. Nurturing Peatland, pay a life and tap it, we get one or the other, but it's also nice because we can sacrifice it and draw a card, and then we can just play it from our grave later and, and draw more cards or just have a land. Um, Overgrown Tomb, it's a shock land, pretty much staple in any two-color deck. Path of Ancestry for Insect, because uh, we can scribe one when we cast Insects. Secluded Courtyard, it's just essentially an untapped duel for Insects. Um, and then Strip Mine, this is really what we want to see when we have, uh, what's this called? What's his face in play? Zack into play. We can tap for a colorless or we can sacrifice it to destroy target land. So I like the idea of just being like, okay, on our turn, strip mine, destroy a land, play it from our graveyard with Zack, destroy another land. So it's like we're missing a land drop essentially, but our opponent is two lands short. And we can do that like every turn. And then if we have like cards that let us play more lands like exploration, we can do it over and over again. Stormyard, I think is funny because it says we can regenerate target insect rat or spider. Um, all that really means is, yeah, the next time it will be destroyed, instead tap it and remove it from combat and heal all damage on it. An easy way to look at it is the old school phrase for regenerate just used to be tap it and give it indestructible. That's really all it is. Takinuma Abandoned Mine. I really like this card a lot because one, it just it's an untapped land that taps for a black. And we can also pay four mana to discard it and then mill three cards and then we can... Um, What's it called? Return a creature or planeswalker from our graveyard to our hand. And then it costs one less if we have a legendary creature. I like this for two reasons. One, it mills three um, and puts it back in our hand. And also uh, we can just play it later on. So it's like a land that like, yeah, we will probably want to channel it and then play it later for its like regular like land ability. Temple of Malady, and on our tap, no big deal. Uh, enters scry one, so we have good uh, card set up and then it taps for one of the others. In budget decks, I like the temples. I think they're fine. Twilight Mire taps for one or the other, um, or both. It's just good filtering if we need it. Unclaimed Territory, that's really it. We just say Insect, tap it for a colorless, or we can get it for a green or a black for insects only. Still pretty good. Basically, we're a secluded courtyard, I'm pretty sure. Undergrowth Stadium, we are always going to have more than two opponents, typically, right? I build these decks in the mind of us going against three opponents in a four-player pod. So we it will come untapped in most cases unless someone died. Final two lands is we have Wasteland, Sacrifice, Wasteland, Destroy Target, Non-Basic Land. Another part of strip locking we can do. And then Woodland Cemetery because it's just an untapped duel. Whoa, I skipped a part. Lands, five swamps, six forests, uh, only 11 non-basics, which I know is kind of probably small if we have Evolving Wilds and Fable Passage. But I think it's fine because we're really running those for like the shuffle parts anyways. Um, so it's good. Miscellaneous about the deck is it's about $304 um, as of the filming of the video, uh, which isn't too crazy. I mean, you can cut, like, you can go budget on some of the lands and, like, cut that in half. Uh, it's really not that expensive if you wanted to make it pretty reasonable. Um, and then the average CMC is 3.35. Thank you guys for watching. Like the video, subscribe, um, and then comment what deck you want me to do next. This deck was actually recommended uh, by a subscriber, so... Thank you for that, and I'll see you guys next time.